Cool. Atamadie, welcome everybody. I will start with the karakia. To tawa mai iranga, to tawa mai iraro, to tawa mai iwaho, to tawa mai iroto. Kieto ai, te mori tu, te mori ora, kite katoa, homie, huie, tai kie. Um, maybe you can hear my dog drinking his water in the background, I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, welcome. Before I hand over to our chair, Mark Little, I just um, would like to ask uh, those who are online, maybe in, use the chat to say uh, where you're from and how you're feeling this morning. Just one word to describe your, you know, um, yeah, just have, what's going on with you this morning. So just to really get a sense of things. So over to you, Mark. Thanks, Amajit, and kia ora koutou. No inga rangi o kutipuna, ko vertu awa pake hira hira ki reira, no te tainga mai a hou ki Aotearoa, ka noho o i waiari ki, ko maua o te maunga mo te haki ki au, ko Mark Little toko inua. Kia ora. Welcome, everybody. My name is Mark Little, and I am the chair of the Healthcare Home Collaborative, which is an absolute privilege, and my part-time job is acting chief exec of Pegasus, so I try and keep the balance right. But look, uh, thank you, thank you for turning up and welcome. Um, it is a pleasure to be part of this virtual summit. It was disappointing that our in-person event as part of HINS this week was postponed due to COVID restrictions, but probably unsurprising. There are such valuable learnings to share right now, which is why we're all here this morning. And I guess like me, most of you are getting pretty good at the virtual stuff, so we'll keep going and uh, make the best of it as we can. I'd like to start by thanking the collaborative team for organising this especially to Kirsten for all the logistical support offered to the team, but also to our amazing speakers. The lineup's gonna be absolutely fantastic and I'm certainly looking forward to participating throughout the day. And before I hand over to our first keynote speaker, I just wanted to share with you some of the changes that are happening with the collaborative. Firstly, the Health Home Collaborative is now called Collaborative Aotearoa. The reasoning behind the shift is really to acknowledge our broader mahi. Along with the important healthcare home model work, the team are supporting digital health across primary care and future localities. The changes are also a direct response to our health reforms so that we can continue to support our general practice teams to become a well-formed well-being partner in a locality setting. And our sharing and learning approach can be applied to other models of care too. We are ready, willing, and able to share our approach to help other aspects of the health and well-being system make the impact that healthcare home has. Our commitment to tertiriti or waitangi, equity and lived experience leadership remains front and centre. The collaborative has demonstrated this through its enhanced healthcare home model, as well as the development of collective impact approach that is tailored to Aotearoa, weaving in and embedding tertiriti or waitangi. We value our trusted relationships and hold whakawhana and tonga at our very core. If you haven't already listened to our beautiful fire Merle share her wisdom on whakawhana and tonga, then I recommend you watch the six minute recording of this. I believe the team sent that out already this morning with some other pre-reading and other material. I'd also quickly like to introduce your collaborative team and say thank you to all of them for their mahi. Amajit, Kirsten, Jess, Kanita, Joe, Fire Merle, Gary and Karoria. Keep on doing what you're doing guys, it is amazing and truly appreciated. And thanks to our members and supporting organizations for their ongoing support. And also for our governors and hosts who help make us do what we do really well and provide guidance and support. And really, I think it's, we, it is that we are together an amazing team. Let's not forget our network leads and change agents. You all help guide our mahi and we are truly grateful for the work you do every day. Without you, we couldn't achieve anything that we've achieved so far. So guys, together you are an amazing team, delivering real and meaningful change. And it's a personal thank you from me and on behalf of the governance group for your contribution, the impact that you make every day. Thank you so much. Keep on doing what you're doing. And I'll now hand over to the wonderful Ira Hapati, who will introduce herself and bring to life our mahi. Kia ora. Tēnā koutou. Kia ora, everybody. Just give me a moment while I share my screen. So from, from one room of um, the Pegasus South Building to another, thanks, Mark, for the introduction. Um, and I'm just checking that, that you should be able to see 
the presentation. So um, I'll just start off with an introduction of who I am. Um, he uri tēnei no kaitahu, ko tūtoko te maunga teitei, e riri ana ngā wai o Makawhio, ki te taha o te marae o te tauraka waka a Māui. Uh, e noho ana ahau i raro i te korowai o kaitahu, ngai tuahuriri ki o tautahi nei. Ko iri hapiti mahuika, tōku ingoa. So I gave a little bit of a whakapapa to where my, um, my whakapapa comes from. So I said that the veins of the maunga of Tutuko, which is the younger brother of Auraki or Mount Cook, um, flows with the waters of Makafio or um, the Jacobs River, which flows down to a little place called um, Bruce Bay or Mahitahi. And Bruce Bay is where my grandfather grew up. Um, and there is a marae there called Te Tauraka Waka a Māori. That's nestled in the west coast of the South Island, the southern um, space, just after the glaciers, um, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. So it's where I love taking my children because there's no Wi-Fi or, um, or internet access for them, so an opportunity to really connect with who they come from and where they come from. Um, in my role, I'm really privileged to work at Pegasus Health in Canterbury, is the director of Hauora Māori and Equity. Um, that means that I sit alongside Mark and other senior leadership um, team members and have a think about and consider what equity and Hauora Māori look like for us here as a PHO in primary health care in Canterbury. Um, and the title of my kōrero today is He Whenu Hei Raranga. So there are two kupu in there um, that I want to focus on and I'll be using throughout this presentation. The first one is the word whenu and the second one is the word raranga. So um, I was lucky enough to start the journey of learning how to weave harakeke a couple of years ago um, through the Wananga Aotearoa. And um, the word whenu is the name given to the individual strands of harakeke that are used to weave. And the word raranga is the action of weaving. And so what I thought was really important um, with the guidance and support of Collaborative Aotearoa um, is to have a think about which whenu we are going to be picking up today to weave our kete or our basket. Um, as we know, or if, you, if you're not sure, when you do weave together a lot of different whenu, it does make those whenu stronger. And the more that you interweave or you raranga into that kete, the stronger it becomes. And um, that really is the theme that I'd like to offer us all this morning. And through that, I wanted to start with a little bit of a karakia or a waiata. Um, I know that we've already opened with karakia and I will um, share these beautiful kupu through um, a waiata. And um, this is what is sung before you cut the harakiki from the plant. So when you go out and you get ready to, um, to harvest some harakiki, uh, this is the waiata or the karakia that's sung. bearing with me in my, um, my uh, very novel um, waiata this morning. But I wanted to share that waiata or that karakia because it is such a vital part of the journey of harvesting harakiki, creating whenu to be able to raranga, which is the analogy we're going to use or the metaphor we're going to use today. In terms of translation, 
Futia means to harvest or to cut. The rito. The rito is the, the small family that's joined together in the beginning. The harakiki plant starts, if you've ever grown harakiki, you know it starts with a little wee family and it grows into this amazing um, plant that's used for so many things. Um, so if we were to cut the, um, the center of the harakiki, the rito, then they're saying kefia te kore mako e ko. So for those of you who know your birds, a kore mako is a, um, a bell bird. They were said, where would the kore mako go to um, sing? Because they talk about the bell bird singing when it's time and when the harakiki is ready to be harvested. So the beginning of that waiata talks about if you were to cut the, the rito, the family, the whanau out of the centre of the harakiki, where would the kore mako go to, to sing? And then ki mai ki ahau, you would say, what is the most important thing in this world? I would tell you that it's he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. So hopefully the word tangata is not a new one to you, but if it is, it means it's the people. So what the, what the uh, metaphor is here is it's talking about the small family at the centre or at the heart of the harakiki bush is representative of um, us as people. And that we need to be really mindful about um, how we are navigating through um, the raranga of harakiki so that we don't um, destroy the harakiki plant by cutting out the rito. So that is the analogy that we wanted to start with today. And um, really a reminder that hia ha te mea nui o te ao, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is people, and as Mark's already said this morning, um, it's about manakitanga, tanga, which those two concepts um, centre around people. Now, as we move um, through the presentation, you'll see some pictures up here on the right-hand side, um, and they will show some progression. So this is a picture here of some different fenders. So when you cut harakeke and you um, cut it into pieces, and then you um, lay it up ready for weaving or for raranga, you'll see it there. The reason that I'm using that picture to set our scene today is because I want to really highlight what our whenu are. Um, and I'm sure that there's no need for reminding that our whenu are um, the principles which are based in te, out of te, te, te Riti or Waitangi, um, our obligations that sit in this space. Um, the fact that we need to ensure that we have equitable health outcomes for Māori and then equitable health outcomes for all. So for many of you, these messages are not new. Um, it is important to start here um, with many of the different conversations that we as a country here have had and are still having at the moment through the Y2575 um, claim, which found that our health system um, is not is in breach of Te Tiriti o Waitangi because there are not equitable health outcomes for Māori. Um, these findings guide our health and disability review um, the establishment of the Māori Health Authority and what our future holds. So although these messages are not new to you, I'm sure, um, it is important to start here and to set this foundation. These are our whenu that we are going to grab to get ready to do some raranga today. Um, we have the guarantee of tino ranga tiratanga, what that looks like for Māori, Māori sovereignty and the opportunity to guide and to um, develop and lead our health care as Māori. The principles of equity, active protection, um, and in partnership, the commitment to achieving equitable health outcomes for Māori, and um, just a reminder, it's not just about reducing inequities; it's actually about achieving equitable health outcomes. So those are the whenu that we are going to hold um, today as we move through the symposium. Um, and as you can see, once we get these beautiful whenu we can start to do some raranga. And, you know, at the beginning, it is about considering what we have, whether we have the right number of whenu, whether we have um, the right knowledge and skills to be able to create, create what we have. And I wanted to just take a, a moment to talk about the healthcare home enhancement model. Um, when I started, I've just been working in healthcare for two years. And um, when I was introduced to the Healthcare Home Collaborative, um, there was a conversation sitting at that time around the enhancement model of the healthcare home collaborative um, work. And from my understanding, what that meant is that some work had happened nationwide, which was led by um, the team that has brought the symposium together today. And then there was some feedback um, that was given 
that possibly some of those messages that we I just talked about um, were not being threaded through some of the healthcare homework. And so um, to the credit of the team, and um, that's inclusive of the whole team across the country, um, the work was stopped and there was the opportunity to review and consider what this looks like in an enhancement space. And the really interesting, and that's when I came into the, um, into the area and I was really, really um, pleased to see that the opportunity to really consider what our treaty and equity obligations look like um, in this model were um, really well considered and consulted with across the country. Um, and so if we take that as a model, what I learned from that is that we can never say that what we are doing is, um, is the final version, the laminated, the pdf version that is never to be um, changed again. What I learned is that the Healthy Home Collaborative are um, very agile and able to respond to that feedback. And so I want us to take those same themes and those same lessons into our work today and into the future. Um, and as I've written here, explore the opportunities which will allow us to enhance um, our practice, support us in exploring our way of being within the um, New Zealand health system. As you start to weave, and you start to introduce more fenu, your, um, your item that you're weaving, your kite or your whariki, whatever it is that you're creating with these fenu, start to take shape and you start to see um, what uh, you are creating. And the reason that I've used this image here, because this is um, sort of a few hours in to weaving a, um, a kite, you can see the pattern starting to emerge. And the one thing that we need to make sure is really um, clear and really important fenu in our kite as we are weaving them is our consumer voice, our consumer experience. Fire Mill was mentioned as well by uh, Mark a little bit earlier, and there was the invitation to um, have a bit of a listen to Fire Mill. She has been leading um, and has been a really strong voice on behalf of consumers. Um, she shares some beautiful corridor about what that is, what that has been like for her. Um, and so the, the wheel or the challenge that I have uh, for you today is to consider, um, to ask yourselves the question in your space, you know, do I know who my consumers, who my whānau, community, um, individuals, and all of those different layers of what we term consumers are? Um, how do we know that? How do we know what they need? Um, and how can they guide and support our journey um, and lead in true partnership? And so that will look different across the way, across the country in every different setting um, and asking ourselves the question, who are our consumers and how do we know what they need and how are we responding to that is, is absolutely vital to the work that we do. So um, that is a really important feeling as we guide and keep developing um, our journey. And just like, our, just like us and our communities and our whānau, um, you know, this is not something that, again, is set. It is something that continually evolves. And so we have to um, come from that place of continual improvement. Um, so I'm very aware of, um, we don't have much time together this morning to set the scene. The purpose of setting the scene for me was to bring to the forefront um, three really key themes, one being um, the opportunity for us to ensure that the whenu we are holding in our hands as we are going to Raranga, this kite today, um, come from our obligations under Te Tiriti o Waitangi um, and our commitment to ensuring their equitable health outcomes for Māori and for all are um, at the forefront. We want to make sure that um, we have a commitment to um, our consumers, our whānau, and putting their needs in um, what they want at the front, at the forefront, making sure that we're driven by um, doing what's right and um, driven by the heart. And then um, the commitment to continuous improvement. So as you'll see in the image that I'm showing on the screen at the moment, that is... Um, a completed kitty, probably, I can't even name the number of hours 
um, to complete that beautiful piece that started from um, the Harakeke plant and was turned into whenu um, and then started to be um, rarangad to a point of completion. But with, as I um, can assure you that every time you look at a completed piece of work, there are always bits in there that you think, oh, I could have done that differently. That's a little bit wonky, actually. Um, it's not quite symmetrical. And um, what I learned through my journey of um, learning the beginning of um, how to laranga or how to weave is that even the most experienced weavers will always look at a piece and have something that they could have done just a little bit differently. Um, and so... The really important thing in that is that there's an acknowledgement there that this is the place in the journey that you are at. This is the opportunity you have to gift this beautiful koha to someone. I remember giving one of my very first kete um, to my sister for her 40th birthday and she looked at it and I could tell in her mind she was thinking, so what is this? Because she couldn't quite tell, um, but she accepted it with love. And she was accepting of the fact that that is a part of our journey. So for me, um, I believe that we are always on a journey of continuous improvement. We'll always look at a kite and think, well, we could have done that slightly different, but let's try again and do something. Then let's do that um, this time. Um, the challenge or the question that I have for you today is how can we add to our kite? How can we learn, grow as a community of healthcare providers across the country? How can we work collaboratively as we enter into this new phase of the health system, which is prioritising um, our obligations under Te Tiriti and bringing to the forefront um, what it is that we, um, we have committed to do uh, for everyone across Aotearoa? And then the most important question really is, what is our measure of success? And how do we know um, what that is. So this is really um, an invitation, an invitation for us all to enter into that journey, which at times can be a little bit scary, especially when we have to ask ourselves the harder questions. Um, for those of us who are asking ourselves those questions on a daily basis, I applaud you. Thank you for being on that wobbly bridge of learning and developing. developing. I remember that vividly when I had had nearly 100 different whenu together in a weaving pattern on a table and then got so frustrated that it almost fell apart and I had to start again from scratch. And I remember some of our kuya coming alongside me and putting their hand on my shoulder and saying, it's okay, this is a part of the journey. And so um, with that in mind, I want to uh, come to an end of our corridor this morning. Um, this is the beginning of what looks like a very, um, a very influential and knowledge-filled um, day with lots of different corridor. I invite you to take um, some whenu and start to raranga your kite from today's symposium. Um, and remember, it will never look as perfect as we want it to look. But as long as we're okay with that, then we are going to keep walking along that journey. So tēnā um, tēnā tato katoa, ko tai mai nei, tēnei hui um, ahakoa te hui ārorohiko. So I just acknowledge for all of us who have come here today, um, although it is on um, Zoom, it is still a great opportunity for us to share knowledge and wisdom. So kia ora. I'm going to end my corridor there and pass back to Amajit. Mm -hmm. I'm taking my mute off. <laughs> I'm going to be doing that all day, I'm sure. Namihi nui, um, Eddie. That was wonderful, Kororo. And um, yeah, great, great start to our um, packed day. Now, we are very aware in terms of our team, just all of the competing objectives. So we appreciate that you're on here today, listening in and participating. But we know the others that couldn't make it will be able to watch that recording as well and Kirsten's designed it so that you can drop in and out as you need to in terms of other things going on we are um waiting for uh Sylvia um from the Tamarack Institute but before she um arrives I thought it would be really good to have a reminder of the day's program so Kirsten's going to pop up um because there's a couple of little uh shifts 
today. Um, and one of the, the main changes were uh, we've got inspiring communities coming on board because um, we had a cancellation from one of our speakers. And again, you know, with everything going on in our world today, that's absolutely understandable. Um, but I think you'll really enjoy Megan um, from Inspiring Communities and the Mahi they're doing uh, around the use of collective impact as well and community led um, development. Um, and we've got our very own uh, Jess White sharing the um, uh, online learning module around digital health. Uh, and that's very relevant right now too. So um, it is, you know, full on day. And as you say, it um, will be very influential, but the sharing will be vital. Um, so just while we wait, I wanted to obviously also give you that opportunity to ask any questions of Iddy. Now, one way to do it is through the chat. All the questions can come through the chat and um, we'll decipher those, but or you can put your little hand signal up and ask it live if you prefer. Monday morning. <laughs> I didn't even get a chance to get a cup of coffee either, so I've got a cup of hot water. Um, are any observations from anybody, just in terms of you know, um, any laying down like they laying down that challenge? I know personally, uh, you know, it's been a real journey for me and learning, and um, yeah, and I and I do think. Um, We've all had our own reflections and learning. So even if it's not a question, maybe an observation. Maybe I'll just have to pick on somebody. I remember a wonderful co-facilitator. Um, and in the end, she, she was just saying, okay, I'm going to pick on somebody. So I'm going Haven't to- Haven't got something to say oh. or ask? Yeah. Go I just it. noticed that there are no break times um, in your in your schedule, and and I do think that's important. So I'm going to challenge you. That's my word. Um, we all need a break, <laughs> and, and perhaps a collective break. <laughs> yes. For, yes. For a variety um, of reasons. Yes. We've, um, yep. Absolutely. We did think about that. Kristen, do you want to talk to that? Or I'm happy to because yeah, we were anticipating people coming in and out of the day and not expecting those to stay on the whole time. Um, and so yeah, it was a tricky one. But um maybe we can we'll be able to weave something in because you know we're nothing if not flexible and agile. Um, but yes, yeah, it is one of the things we talked about and it was a bit of a um a trade-off. Um, what we may do um, is, Andrew, we might put you on the spot and bring you oh, forward. Just got another question, Amjie. Um, Marie. Yeah, tēnā koto katoa ki ora, morena ko Maria Ho, o whakatū, te tau ihu o whakatū. Um, Nelson Health Consumer Council. This question to um, Iri Hapiti. Um, I see that you are, it says something about you, director of the Ma Maori Health. Um, so is that part, is that the actual of the part of the already health reform that we, the government is working on? You know, the three, there's Maori Health, the primary and the uh, Health New Zealand. So is that something to do with that? Is that, I don't even know. Um, yeah, no, it's not. It's, it's the name of the role um, that we've given here at Pegasus to um, to do the strategic work across the organisation. Um, and we are trying to stay really connected to um, the Māori Health Authority and how that's developing. I would say that the best of anyone is wanting some information um, and wanting to understand what that looks like within your own region, the way that the Māori Health Authority is, um, and I'm not speaking on behalf of them, but for, this is just me sharing what I know, um, is rolling out is through the EU partnership boards. So um, each region has a, um, a grouping of um, mana whenua or tangata whenua um, based around iwi groupings, mm -hmm. um, and every region is slightly different. Um, but on the most part, you can find a connection to someone in there who um, are working with the transition unit to have a look at what that looks like within your region. So each region is different. 
So is, my role doesn't sit there. All right, Kiara. So is this collaborative hui that you're collaborative hui that you're having now? Is this to also carry an influence still on all that changes that's had to happen? Are you? Is that one of the outcomes as well? As well as filling our kitty, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> um, Do you mean for today? For today, this this hui, this zui. Um, is this um, to influence that still uh, put something around that table of that whole corero on the reform, on the health reform? Is that I, think that it, I think that it's, it, it primarily has an objective of growing and developing our workforce across primary health care. And um, as was mentioned earlier, the collaborative have been going for um, quite a while and will continue to whatever the future looks like. Um, but without a doubt, there is opportunity um, and there will be opportunity to connect and share information um, through to the transition unit, the new Health, um, health New Zealand and Māori Health Authority, um, whether it is through this forum and through um, Collaborative Aotearoa or um, in, other in lots of other different ways. Mm. Do you know, Amajit, whether there's um, opportunity to share from a primary health perspective into that space yet? In terms of the, the actual uh, transition unit and health reforms, I think, you know, we're continually um, liaising um, with the unit and continuing to influence, you know, as are many across the sector. Uh, and I do think the mahi that comes out of today, especially, um, you know, the, the collective impact framework and localities. I mean, there are lots of other parts to the reforms, but that is an area um, that we're putting some work into to support. So the answer is, you know, yes, we will continually um, influence. And, and sometimes, you know, we, um, the network is, um, has so much knowledge and what we'll be gathering as well today is that knowledge and then sharing it so that, you know, those that are actually um, have those decision making powers as such can hear, you know, some of the first hand experiences, first hand advice, because it's when you're living and breathing the mahi, then, you know, um, you kind of know what's needed. Uh, so, yes, yeah, we are um, continuously knocking on the door uh, and sharing. Um, and we'll continue to do so, you know, we'll, um, yeah, alongside others. Yeah. Kia ora, kia ora. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Um, we still haven't got our um, other uh, guest speaker who is, um, it's three o'clock on a Sunday there in, in, in Toronto. Um, but maybe she's having some technology issues. I'm not sure. Um, but Andrew, are you happy to jump into your? Yeah, sure. Um, yep. I think that, that would be awesome. And so we've got Dr. Andrew Miller um, from Bush Road in, in Whangarei. And Andrew is uh, also um, the clinical lead on our uh, collaborative. And, you know, we call him a legend because, you know, right from the outset, Andrew was there alongside us on this journey and just bringing inspiration to us. So we're absolutely grateful. And so Andrew's going to lay down a challenge too this morning to you. So sit back and enjoy. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen if that works. So... Ko Andrew Miller toko ingoa no ingarangi oku tipuna e tai mai oku tipuna ki Aotearoa i te 1840 Gold Rush i tupa ake au ki te Whangarei Atara e noho ano au ki kāmo whaan e rei tanga parao ko tene tako mihi ni tanga uh, tanga tofenua o te taikoro ka mihi hoki au ki na tohu o te rohine no reda tena koto katoa. Uh, my friend Claudia, who's a consumer representative up here in Kitty Kitty, um, when she was talking to me recently uh, about the stuff I um, tend to bang on about, thought that it would be quite useful to me to call my presentation uh, to Wero. And I, uh, Wero is the uh, uh, performance uh, at the entry to a marae for prestigious visitors. Um, uh, Taki has um, laid down, um, this is a challenge item, in front of the visitors, and if it's picked up peaceably by a member of the party, visiting party, signals a peaceful intent. Uh, 
Um, I am probably been a visitor most of the time um, in that I uh, tend to be uh, given tucky dropped in front of me, which I pick up and have a habit of um, looking at closely and then carrying around and dropping in front of other people. Uh, many of the clever have had me doing that for their uh, practices around the country. Um, very interested in good ideas. I don't actually think I'm a leader. I'm more of a, a habit follower. Something sounds like it's a good idea to, to me. I'm quite happy to um, carry that forward. Um, I'm going to talk today about a few tucky. I'm going to talk about tucky for consumers. I'm going to talk about tucky for uh, general practice, for our PHO organisations in this transition, and probably some of the things that the uh, Health NZ and Māori Health Authority are going to see as challenges as we move into the future. One thing that I think is that I found over the course of time is that I've got responsibility for what I do and what happens inside my practice at least. I've also taken that responsibility into health governance and I was the chair of Manaya PHO in Whangarei for 16 years. I've been involved in the collaborative since its inception. I've been involved as a consumer representative in the head and neck uh, regional cancer stream and national work uh, program around changing head and neck cancer uh, um, services in New Zealand. So I've come from a few angles and so I carry a few bits of information over my head from various places. I've actually been um, told I'm too informed to be a consumer, which always makes me uh, surprised that having information um, and taking it to meetings as a consumer, to stand up the doctors who they're challenging that the status quo is all right, uh, is always an entertaining uh, undertaking. So I think at the moment we're being handed really the once in a lifetime opportunity, taking up a proactive leadership role, not just in the future of primary care, but alongside our community to shift our model of care to one that focuses on holistic wellbeing. This doesn't come very often. Clearly it has come around because when we're looking at what we're currently doing, it's not fit for purpose. You don't have a big health and subsidiary review and a big shuffle of how things are done if it's all working well. And we're living in a really divisive world at the moment. You know, this stuff going on with COVID, but also social media and the divisions we're having really sometimes uh, upsets and surprises me because clearly we're often talking about the same thing. That little picture there I think is quite nice because quite often whatever that reality is, the middle, um, could be described in a number of ways. And quite often you sit quietly and listen to what people have to say. They're describing exactly the same thing, but with their, with their own worldview. And I could probably just about end my whole presentation here. Um, this little diagram um, we created up here up, in, up north, just to make it a little bit easier to have conversations around um, engaging with people about what matters to them. Um, simply this diagram you would give to someone and say, just put a X on the line where you feel things are a bit tough for you at the moment. Uh, it makes conversations around engagement so much easier. It uh, allows uh, you just suss out the things that really matter to whānau. Um, and uh, we are hoping that uh, this gets embedded into our software, both the whānau software used for shared care up north, but also there's a big process called RCCC in, north, uh, in the northern region. And both of them are looking at having this as the launch page. Um, and why would we do that? It's basically this, and you've probably all seen this, but we as health providers are only that 20% below the knees. Um, the rest of people's well-being, the things that matter to them, the things that make a difference to how they feel, resides above the knees. Um, and unless we actually start approaching those, um, we've got no hope of doing our job right. We've got no hope of actually fixing what matters. We've got no hope of engaging properly or showing a really proper manakitanga to actually care for people, not just care about giving them prescriptions and the right uh, evidence-based guidelines, but actually caring about who they are and what they need and what they want to make them well. So, I said we don't, you know, we need to accept status quo isn't working. Uh, we need to create this model of care. It needs to be across government. It needs to be across all the agencies that are able to affect those things above the knees. Um, and that can't be powered up by our PHOs or even um, our regions. I think it needs to be powered up centrally by both Health NZ and the Māori Health Authority. They need to pull the levers across sectors to make things work for the um, people that we're serving. And sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy, but it's cut straight out of Heather Simpson's report. And I'll let you read that. I'll sit quietly for a minute, have a little drink, but have a quick read of that. So 
So in a nutshell, we've been told from that review, and this is what transition unit um, and uh, working on is exactly what I've just spoken about. So this is coming from uh, a view that we need to be doing things differently. We often talk about patient experience, and I think that's absolutely 100%. So the people that um, come into our, our provider uh, agencies and um, need to be have an experience that's about what matters to them, it needs to be respectful and engaged. But we also need to be really wary and careful of how we're um, looking after our care teams. One of the great things I think about the model of care that we do with healthcare homes is it's managed to deal with some of the really pressing stuff about urgent unplanned care at the same time also looking after patient experience. So we can't be trying to make reforms that actually great work great for the people we're trying to serve and then kill our care teams. And at the moment it's a little bit of this. If I was to pull out that wellbeing wheel um, and talk to people about that, they're going to give me things that I can't sort out. Um, I'm going to feel really unhappy about that. They're going to feel unhappy about that. To a degree, I'm a GP and it's, I'm sitting in the trenches literally with a pea shooter. Um, and at the moment, there's are some people up on the Chateau drinking Bordeaux talking about how it's going to look. But we need to be given the tools to um, make what I'm talking about actually real. One of the things that needs to happen immediately is that the information that um, we hold needs to be given back to our consumers. They need to be owners of information. Uh, they need to know what's going on. They need to be able to self-manage. Um, and when they want to engage with us and we can participate them, then they're um, going to be able to use that information in a way that they, um, we're collaborating. The only time you're a patient is when you're unconscious. And as I said, I've been a consumer and I'm not saying that in a way that I've been off to the doctor. I ended up off work for 16 months at one stage um, and uh, had, I think, 40 different care providers look after me. Um, during that time, I had heaps of service. I got well looked after, but I had no care. No one actually asked me any of the things I've just talked to you about. I had no portal or triage, no access to my results, no ability to message my practice, uh, no same day triage. I got given no shared care plan or advanced care plan. I've had cancer twice now. I've again been through it again. No one has ever given me an advanced care plan. No one's ever said to me, how this goes belly up, Andrew. What do you want to do? I've written one myself because I can do that. Uh, but it still surprises me how little we actually focus on what uh, matters to Fano. Certainly, as you might gather from what I was saying, it sharpened my focus a bit about what we should expect. And it's given me the silver lining. I, I get to look at things differently here. And I, I get to talk to you guys about things from a different angle. And you talk about this Fano test or patient test. This is our friend, Helen Parker. If we were to look at what we actually did, we took a room full of uh, Fano and people we look after it. Tell them what we currently do. Ask them if it's reasonable and defensible. We need to probably apologise and consider things from their view. Um, and we can put that final test into action anywhere. This is not, following slide is not to bag my colleagues. I've shown this around the country before. It's just to show that change is difficult. And if we leave it for the providers to decide what change looks like, this is what actually tends to happen. So Porter's been around for the last eight to 10 years. We've got 67% of general practices in New Zealand offering one. They offer them to an average of 17% of their patients. That's 11%, one in 10 New Zealanders got a portal. Only 10% of those practices offer their patients the ability to read their notes. So about one or 2% of New Zealanders can read their notes 10 years after portals came into being. So how does that performance equate to care and service for our patients? And how would you compare that to banking, travel, or accommodation? At the moment, one of those guys who's in a true service industry saw that other people were doing it, everyone did it instantly. If you had a bank that didn't offer internet banking, you couldn't book a ticket online, or you couldn't book an accommodation online, you'd be scratching your heads. So I'm not bagging my colleagues, I'm just saying that we've got a problem if we're relying on practices to make a decision of how good looks for patients. And I do bump into this, and I think this is a real challenge. We have colleagues who just are not interested in making this easy for people. My friend recently was at a regional diabetic specialist group meeting. They're looking at how diabetes services would be um, uh, 
better worked amongst different providers. And one of the most senior diabetologists in New Zealand said, when shown what that well-being wheel, that is a complete waste of time. I don't know why you'd even bother with that. Everyone's banging on about social determinants. I'm not going to be doing that, that's for sure. And that was almost word for word. Um, we need to remove that people from decision making that have that attitude. That's certainly a challenge. I want to talk a little about Mahi Tai Hora um, because I think we did something up north that was big enough and brave enough and, and um, right enough for Heather Simpson to spend a considerable amount of time when she wrote her review. So on paper, tier one looked like the aspirations of what we tried to form up in Northland. Um, need to start to say that the rest of us are all going to have to go down this journey, not by um, our own intentions, but by actual whatever decided by the transition unit and, and government. But so did Mate. Our district health board said we don't want two PHOs in Northland, we want one. Um, and they repeatedly sent letters telling us when it was going to occur over a three year period. Um, we decided as two PHO boards that that wasn't what we were going to do. We needed to decide what good looked like. And it did take us three years because we spent a lot of time trying to work towards a position that was more collaborative and more fit for purpose. And in fact, is what on paper tier one is meant to look like. Um, probably the, one of the hardest three years of my life in terms of winding up a company as a chair of a company and for my colleagues handing over their governance, their shareholding and all their assets to a new organisation. So it was pretty tiring. And so what I want to describe is some of the problems we faced, the lessons we learned. Simply put, we had to have a vision or a co-papa. And that one I would have thought could be um, used throughout the country. It's just having a system that sustains equitable self-determined wellbeing. So we valued self-determined wellbeing, equity, transparency, collaborative empowered leadership. Um, those things are pretty hard to argue. And at times when people were getting into slippery situations, we, we came back to that and said, do you disagree with any of those points on that page? And no one ever could. The following slides are actually part of a, um, a paper written by these three professors from Auckland University, They're quite different backgrounds. So they come from uh, business school, um, from social work and from politics. And they interviewed the key stakeholders up in Northland during this process, transition process and look, listen to the story. And I think everything is stories, but the story in Northland, uh, they found extremely interesting because they found it full of paradoxes and then from those links um, gave us a lesson. So this is what they found. There's a paradox between our organisations and the way we do. We're, we're unchanging pinnacles. We've been around for 20 years, PHOs and DHBs. Um, and if we want to change and we are going to be asked to change, we're going to have to change our path and that's uncomfortable. You're going to have to jump off and, and swim or jump into a, a flow that might take you somewhere you don't um, not quite sure. We also, that's pinnacle one as our organisation. Pinnacle two is what we said of just things that we are not ever going to let go of, that we need whatever we do to be passionate and whanau led from a community. Te tariti is key and inalienable and arguable. And Y2575 would uh, say that, in fact, we have got lots of redress to make and that everything we do has to be equitable. Paradox two is that when you've got a group of people that are trying to move something, some are going to climb further and faster um, and often have this well-developed idea of what good looks like in the head. And at times you can have to turn back uh, to others who are further back or just arriving uh, into the discussion. So at times we actually found this happen quite a bit. Uh, I won't spend too much time looking at the blocks, but we also have to manage a process of actually getting from end to end with the transition, but also make it meaningful. We had to build trust with each other, but also in our conversations, we were seeking conflict. We were looking to find what the elephants in the room were. We were trying to find what reservations people were having. We needed to listen carefully and spend less time talking uh, to find out where people were anxious or where people felt that the change was too much for them. Um, we started the process actually quite distrustful. The two boards didn't trust each other at all, not because we, um, uh, you know, it was prior, 
not enough prior knowledge of each other and not enough understanding that we had shared ideas. And so um, the first few meetings were quite difficult until we came up with that first page of, of our vision and principles. There's also a paradox of holding on. So people want to hold on to what they've got, no doubt. But the recognition is that we're not going to move unless we let things go. So um, this is going to happen to all of us in this transition. So those paradoxes lead to a bunch of lessons for us. These you could come back to because we're recording this if you want to stop and, and read the right-hand side. But the lessons that the professors through their uh, research say that we have to, you have to develop a cope up early. That's actually the vision and principles that anchor your conversations and do your planning and work out your negotiation struggles. Pretty comfortably, anyone in our collaboration cope up could articulate what we were trying to do in a in a elevator pitch. It's not complicated at all. Uh, once you realise that you've simplified it down to wanting self-determined well-being, and um, it, it becomes much easier than uh, you think. The other thing I think we are going to need to do, and this um, uh, is something that's not been done, I don't think, uh, or thought of clearly, is having an intermediary, some sort of outsider. Uh, who's got really sophisticated governance, facilitated project management, relationship building skills. You can't do this on your own. You can't hope that your governance boards with some vested interest in be able to sort this through. Um, I think this is going to be incredibly important with collective impact, that if we want our localities to harm our communities to have a voice, then we currently don't have the skill set to do that. And we certainly didn't have the skill set to get through our collaboration co-papa without an intermediary who, who kept us honest, kept us true north throughout. Um, recognise that stakeholders are going to have to engage with loss. Some of the loss actually wasn't material or financial. It didn't even happen. It was a future loss. It was a fear of loss. Um, it's this thought that maybe in the future that you lose some power or autonomy or resource or voice. That's a real thing. And it's sometimes just a matter of having conversations about fearing fearful or not happy about the not the not knowing. And a lot of it was just spending time on relationships. We spent hours around tables talking to each other, became friendly with each other, but realised we were all on the same page. That cylinder I showed you at the start um, became solider. So it might have been a square or circle to start with, but at the end of it, we were all aware that the cylinder had many sides to it. Um, that This is the... Um, Climbing, back, uh, climbing up and going back is that some people weren't ready and at times you had to actually wait uh, um, and not force things along. Um, we did in fact leave some people completely behind. I don't, don't think you can wait for everybody to, um, to agree to something if you want to make progress. Other thing that was tricky is we had continuous change of some of the actors or stakeholders um, and people would come in not having had all the pre-work um, with um, sometimes good new ideas, but quite often trying to re-litigate uh, stuff we'd already decided on. Um, and in fact, one of our things we probably be looking back to uh, sort out as well as we could is that when we finally got to the end of it, um, when we tried to execute it, a brand new person came in trying to execute something that a bunch of people had taken three years to, to create, um, and that caused a bit of a hiccup. Um, and have a meticulous process. So, by that, I mean that we documented everything we'd done, the protocols we'd come to, the planning. Um, and it was also a running joke that all this was on uh, half the forest and north were on the table at every meeting. But it means we didn't have to go back over what we'd already decided. We kept on moving forward. So those are just the lessons. So I won't run through that. It's just what I've talked about. So where are we now in, up north? Well, to be frank, we've probably stalled. And that's not the fault of anything we did. It's just we created what tier one should look like. And then we were left pretty much in the trenches with pea shooters. We did not have a environment that would allow this to occur. We didn't have the um, funding streams or a consolidated funding streams or a, a single unitary body. We still had DHPs, PHOs, Māori providers, NGOs, everything just as we are right now, which makes it very difficult to try and realise a vision that requires something larger and more collaborative. So we're still, but we're still, you know, remain optimistic and hopefully the reforms will make some of this start moving forward. And I think the other thing too, um, and I've stolen this from our friend Paul Schmitz, is, and hopefully our next speaker will talk about it, that 
whatever you do on paper, whatever the review looked like, tier one looked like, that's just paper. That in fact, it's the culture of what we do, it's how we do it, not what we're doing. Um, so could someone actually come to any of our meetings or, or in the future come into a locality and actually feel that we're all there to take action together and not that someone's come to tell you how it's going to look or this is what we're going to do? Are we taking responsibility, actually, that we're all going to do this? Which is incredibly simple if you think well-being is what we want to do. Just stick to it. Um, actually, are we day-to-day -day practicing the values to, to each other and the way we deal with each other? Are we walking the walk? Are we treating each other with care and well-being? If you can't have your employer treat the staff with well-being, you can't have the well staff treating each other with well-being, you can't have uh, uh, us as providers treating um, everyone we bump into with well-being, you can't have a system that's predicated on well-being. So uh, hopefully with some, you know, taking that on board, whatever we do you should actually be walking the walk. And at times we're not talking about elephants in the room. Uh, people will either stonewall or become defensive uh, and not let you know what, why, why they don't want to move. And that is difficult and at times has to be um, out to tell the truth. One thing I would actually say, um, heads up to my collaborative colleagues, the one place I think where culture eats strategy is the collaborative. Uh, I never go to a meeting there which isn't the best meeting of the month. I never have any thought that we're not in there for the right reasons of wellbeing. There's no hidden agendas. Um, it's the one place I feel constantly excited, constantly on the right track and constantly challenged. So I think we are walking the walk, guys, and that might be my bias, but um, let's keep trying, hey? Now, I'm not trying to say there's actually our current fighter networks don't have any um, uh, future as such, um, in that, um, but to realise the aspirations of the community, um, we need to take away commissioning and funding from regions or localities where there could be appearance of best interest, not actually there might not be, but just the appearance of it. Um, so, I think once we start engaging our communities, I think we're going to realise that our PHOs or current support agencies just aren't fit for purpose. Um, it's not our failure, just we were never created to have the breadth and vision um, and the silos funding is, you know, left in decades of us being non-collaborative. So tier one wants to work, we need to be courageously different, not a mashup of what we currently got. And again, I think we need to be bringing people with a collaborative impact skill set into the mix. And I'm also, also keen that we should be presenting solutions. Um, it's always more successful bringing solutions to tables and voicing complaints and barriers. Um, last time I looked, there was way more work in primary care than people to do it. I mean, we should all be gainfully employed. I can't think we won't be, just in maybe a different role. And I think we need to get out of our offices and into our communities. If we're talking about lean and gimbu walking, we need to be in a much that. Some of the time we spend in offices is time that we better spend centralised um, by, by doing it once and doing it right. And we should be getting out and about and actually finding out exactly what matters to whānau, bringing their um, stories back and trying to get something done about it. So these are just some of my possible solutions, I guess. I think we just make it easy. Don't make this harder than it needs to be. Uh, we make well-being and that wheel I was showing you, the vision of what we do. Um, we do need to operate as localities. We need to get the voice of the community, but we need to be supported more centrally. So whatever funding and commission needs to probably be agnostic and centralised. I also think it needs to be based on good data and business intelligence. And again, that should be centralised. We've all got various capacities in our networks and organisations for some IT or some data, but that could be much richer and actually cross-sectorial and it could then allow decisions to be made really on where needs lies, not on who's got the loudest voice or the, or the, um, you know, the best current uh, ability to manipulate what's working. I think also we need to take away the uh, ownership of health information and give it back to whānau and patients. We need to have patient-centred IT systems where they can self-manage and uh, then participate when they need to. Um, that's quite possible to be done um, and it would shift the paradigm by stealth. We wouldn't have to win hearts and minds by doing that. We'd just have to have it running well, and people would find that their workflow flows down the well-being pathway rather than a hard medical pathway, which is often failing people. And we need to 
ask each other hard questions at times about why we don't think these type of things would work. Um, and we can start doing that, I think, now. I mean, we're doing it today. And, and I think that probably the people on this um, uh, meeting and who I'm talking to probably um, you know, aren't, aren't going to um, argue too much against what I've just stated. Again, it's a, simply that Martin Luther King said, the time is always right to do what is right, to do what is right. I'm a great believer in that. I don't think we need to be waiting for three months, six months, and nine months. I never have. If someone says that, why don't we do this? I say, I can't see why not. If something comes up that actually looks like it looks right, why don't we do it right now? So by that, I'm saying, why don't we start actually asking some of these wellbeing questions or um, having an approach with each other, which actually says that we're going to do this for each other with our communities and start doing that now, regardless of what our final um, um, acronyms look like. I mean, since I've been a GP, I think we've had area health boards, crown health entities, regional health authorities, DHBs, IPAs, PHOs, and fundamentally, the only thing that's changed in my practice probably is health games and the collaborative. Something that's made a difference to me and the people I look after. And that's because we didn't wait, we just got on with it. And that's my final slide. If you think you're leading and no one is following you, then you're only taking a walk. It's an Afghan problem. So that's me done. Thank you so much for giving me the privilege of speaking to you. So some of the thoughts that go through my head, um, it's a pretty messy space inside my head, I tell you. Take myself off mute again. Wow, Andrew, as always, absolutely inspiring, you know, laying down that challenge for us and some of the comments coming, or some of the chat coming through um, has been really good to see in some recommended links. Do, um, do uh, any of you have questions directly for Andrew? Certainly some of the work um, around the paradoxes. Uh, we've got the presentation that Andrew shared with us and we will we'll pass that on because some of that Mahi is just so insightful. Um, so yeah, open the floor. You can either put your hand up and ask the question live or via the chat, we can keep, keep that. And oh, over to you guys. Okay. Who am I going to pick on? Going to pick on Lisa. Are you still there, Lisa Brennan? Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, I've heard a lot of that before, but it was actually inspiring. Um, uh, the uh, the patient is not a patient unless you're unconscious. Is a, um, a fabulous. Um, my concern is the patient portal. Um, we have a very low uptake in patient portal here in Canterbury, and. Uh, yeah, and open notes is almost non-existent and it is an absolute um, tragedy, really. Uh, so that's something that we're desperately trying hard to, to, um, to work on and I think that's going to be our focus for the next little while. But um, thank you for that, um, that corridor, Andrew. Yeah, I think, Lisa, one of, the, one of the problems we face is that the decision makers, decision makers in health at the moment are old white guys like me. You know, and honestly, the, the, the practice owners and some of the people you know around who seem to be the influential decision makers don't share what I'm describing at all um, and will always look for problems, uh, whether they exist or not. Um, and how you do how you get around that when you've actually got people that own and make decisions is difficult. Um, probably um, if we were to, to set up a new... Um, system up in the northern region that's actually all the primary care services but uh, general practice is going to be uh, patient driven patient owned patient centered um, it would probably become apparent that that makes life a lot more satisfying easier um, for both patients and providers and um, they might well take it on then but yeah we've got a we've got a barrier least to changing people's hearts and minds it's um it's a tough one that's why we're in it together Um, Majit, you on mute? I'm on mute. Um, what I would also um, invite everyone to do, and I know this is, you know, takes time and takes thought, 
But um, as, a, as a collaborative, wanting to share the stories that are absolutely vital for, you know, that reflection and making change. If you um, have five minutes spare and you want to drop us an email with your story, your journey uh, or reflections, that's just going to enrich our mahi so that we can, again, you know, pass on to those um, making the decisions so that they're much more informed. And we, we've tried to do that, but we, you know, we are... Um, we're pretty lean here at the collaborative and we rely on our networks. So uh, any stories that you um, are able to share is just going to be fantastic for us. And our next um, session, we're still having to juggle the agenda around as our Canadian speaker um, must be having some difficulty. We are going to juggle things around and we'll have um, some insights from um, our lived experience advisors that have been sitting alongside our mahi. But before we do that, just one final uh, opportunity to ask questions. Uh, and again, you know, later in the day, you can still come back after reflecting on Andrew's um, very inspiring talk. You can come back and ask a question then. But if there's anything now, um, take this opportunity. Otherwise, we're going to have a 10 minute break. Uh, so taking on the challenge <laughs> and uh, have a 10 minute break. And then we'll come into uh, hearing from those with our lived experience and have some opportunities again to, you know, share some stories. Um, Ajit, we just had um, quite a few comments on Andrew's wellbeing well, which is fantastic. And um, obviously the collaborative is, you know, we're all about sharing. So um, Kirsten, you'll see, has put the link um, to the wellbeing wheel up to our website. So feel free to pop over there and have a look. Um, Andrew's been kind enough to share that. So, yeah. Yep, and I'll share, I'll send it out when I send the recordings out as well, so that in the email. Yeah, and, and we'll capture, um, you know, those um, gold nuggets in the chat. Uh, and so when the recordings and presentations come out, you can actually, you know, um, have reference to those because, yeah, it's in the share and that I think we're going to have the richness. So on that note, so Kirsten, what time would you like us back? Actually, Judy's just raised your hand. Oh. Oh, hello, Judy. Yay. Thanks. I took a little while to discover how to do that. Um, <laughs> thank you, Andrew. That was wonderful. I'm, I'm fascinated because to me, there's a dual tension between um, needing to lift um, digital health literacy amongst um, consumers, but also, on the other hand, and I say this with a, with a, a great um, example that's, you know, a recent one. I have a daughter-in-law who's a GP, and um, she has had two recent migrants from the UK, a, an older um, male GP who's really struggled to get his head around the digital aspects of um, their practice, and a young Scottish um, doctor woman who's absolutely just picked it up and flown with it and my concern is that there are an awful lot of GPs because we've got an aging workforce who are not comfortable around the digital um, area and that's actually also one of the blockages. Yeah agreed and I mean that's sometimes a, a, you know whether we can work out with conversations with them what they're not what they're not liking about it or what they're having difficulties with and um, maybe not. Um, for some of them, they, they opt off actually providing those services. Someone else within their practice um, takes over that role for them. Because some of the stuff around messaging or um, uh, the like could be done by uh, or uh, done by someone else within the practice. Interestingly, for um, you know, we're also making decisions. I guess around we talk about literacy. I think if we are the way we present information isn't clear, then it's the clarity we're not giving uh, people around information. But when we hold it, we're making assumptions, and I think we should be releasing whatever we do have and allowing people to, to look at it and make their own um, decisions around, you know, what we have. I, I agree, though, Judy, with some of our colleagues there, they are going to struggle because this is new work or something they're not comfortable with. But that's, again, respectfully conversing with them and finding out why is probably all, there'll be ways around that. Thank you. Any others before we jump into the break? If everyone can be back at 10.30, that would be wonderful and have a nice cup of tea.